Great, thank you everyone for being here this evening. We're gonna go ahead and get started and I know folks will be joining us. Thank you for being here tonight for this wonderful conversation we're gonna have between Hanif Abdurraqib and Tongo Eisen Martin in celebration of Hanif's latest book, A Little Devil in America, Notes and Praise of Black Performance. My name is Nia McAllister and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. As we gather here today, it is essential to acknowledge the times we're living in and the current circumstances we're navigating. Moad stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter in recognizing and condemning white supremacy and the ongoing systemic violence against Black people. We honor and mourn the census murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Aubrey, Tony McDade, Casey Goodson Jr., Patrick Warren Sr., Andre Hill, Dante Wright, Anthony Thompson Jr., Micaiah Bryant, and so many others who've lost their lives in police brutality and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. We want to acknowledge that Maud's commitment to racial justice is ongoing, and as such, we will continue to say these names and to hold space and honor these victims. I also want to acknowledge the spaces that we're occupying. And though we're gathered virtually, many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent. And our institutions were founded upon the exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples whose lands were located on. It is with deep respect that Moad acknowledges that even in virtual space, we here in what we call San Francisco and Oakland reside on unceded Chichenyo and Ramatashaloni lands. And we thank these indigenous communities of the Bay Area and beyond who've stewarded this land throughout the generations. And we do encourage everyone to learn about the native lands that you do occupy by visiting nativeland.ca. And with that, again, I wanna thank everyone for joining us this evening. And I wanna give a special thank you to the San Francisco Public Library for co-presenting this program with us. It is a pleasure now to introduce our two guests for this, evening, this evening's conversation, Hanif Abdurraqib and Tongo Eisen Martin. Hanif Abdurraqib is a, is a New York Times bestselling poet, essayist, and cultural critic from Columbus, Ohio. His poetry has been published in Pen American, Muzzle, Vinyl, and other journals. His essays and criticism have been published in The New Yorker, Pitchfork, The New York Times, and Fader. He is the author of the poetry collections, The Crown Ain't Worth Much, A Fortune for Your Disaster, and the essay collection, They Can't Kill Us Until They Kill Us, and Go Ahead in the Rain, Notes to a Tribe Called Quest. Abdurraqib was named the guest at curator at the Brooklyn Academy of Music beginning in January, 2021, and is also the host of Sonos podcast, Object of Sound. He is a graduate of Beechcroft High School. And originally from San Francisco, Tongo Eisen Martin is a poet, movement worker, and educator. His latest curriculum on extrajudicial killing of Black people, We Charge Genocide Again, has been used as educational and organizing tools throughout the country. His book entitled Someone's Dead Already was nominated for a California Book Award. And his latest book, Heaven is All Goodbyes, was published by the City Lights Pocket Poet Series and was shortlisted for the Griffin's Poetry Prize and won a California Book Award and American Book Award. His forthcoming book, Blood on the Fog, is being released this fall in the City Lights Pocket Poet series. He is San Francisco's eighth poet laureate. Welcome both. Nia, yeah, thanks so much for that intro and hello everyone. I'm scattering uh, or scrambling because I just changed my mind on what I wanted to read. <laughs> at the very last minute. And while I locate it, I will say that um, I appreciate uh, Nia naming all of the folks that we've lost. And um, for those who don't know, I'm from and live in Columbus, Ohio. And three of those names, uh, Casey Goodson Jr., Andre Hill, and, and most recently, Micaiah Bryant, are folks who were also residents of this place. And um, it has been difficult in the city. It's been a difficult winter and it gave way to a, a difficult spring. And, um, you know, folks who know me well know that my work as a writer is uh, is very different perhaps than my work as someone who, who does organizing and movement work like I know Tongo does as well. Um, and so it's, it's been a challenging week. And so I, I really appreciate y'all um, having me. And I am uh, going to read 
a thing um, about blackface because I think it is one of the more playful things in the book, weirdly. Um, I'm not going to read all this. This is from the essay, 16 Ways of Looking at Blackface. And I'm going to just read a small handful of them. I don't really read this piece out loud a lot. And so, um, yeah, we'll see. Two, since the election, white people have been pretending to be black on the internet, though to be entirely fair, I suppose, there are white people pretending to be black on the internet before the election too, but now people are talking about it. People are talking about it in part because the white people who are pretending to be black on the internet are so bad at it. My friend wonders what it says about black people that we can so easily recognize a slang that is not leaping from the tongues and fingers of one of our own, but I maintain that it's the pictures they use, the obvious stock photos of black men in suits with bad hairlines or black women with one raised eyebrow and a forced smirk affixed to their faces in the direction of both no one and everyone. Sure, I do also peep the use of dated slang and the belabored nature of languages, haphazard arrangements in the tweet or the photo caption. Anyone who speaks a language inside a language can see when that dialect is presenting a challenge for someone who perhaps had to Google the correct word to use and the placement of it, or when it is coming from someone who watched a movie with a black person in it once and then never saw a black person again, it would be humorous or fascinating if it wasn't so suffocating. I would laugh if I was not being smothered by the violence of the imagination. Four, there's that scene at the end of Eight Mile that everyone loves, where Eminem's character is in the rap battle to end all rap battles against Papa Doc, his longtime foe. In the scene, Eminem goes first in the battle and ticks off all the predicted insults he believes Papa Doc has stashed, ready to unleash on him. When he's done, he tosses the mic to Papa Doc, who stumbles over a few words before being buried under waves of applause in celebration of watching someone triumph by rendering their opponents immovable. Five. There are a lot of things people get wrong about blackface, but the one I think about is the way they slather the makeup on their faces as if they've never seen a black person before, usually pitch black and wildly uneven or smeared haphazardly over the skin with no attention to detail. I have thought before about how this feels like an additional insult positioned to top the obvious one, how even an attempt to mimic cannot be done with enough care for the skin of the mimicked because I cannot take off my skin. I ask my homies for a skincare routine and the group Group chat sprawls with the names of products and links to them. I wander a Whole Foods and ask Safia exactly which exfoliating loofah glove I should purchase, sending photos of my findings. Jason tells me I can't go wrong with Cetaphil as a base. All I know is that I've had the good fortune of having largely great skin for three decades with no real work put into it, and I'm looking to see what might be the fullest potential for my skin's immor immortality. I come from an ageless people, after all. At most Black functions I've been to, someone pulls me aside points at some alleged elder and asked me to guess how old the elder is. And when I guess too young, they throw out some age bordering on the absurd, one that seems even more foolish as the sunlight gallops across the absence of wrinkles during a vigorous dance or a laugh that rattles the wind. I most love the mythology of the ageless blacks, how it truly doesn't crack unless you give yourself over to do the bidding of some evil. Like we've all been blessed, but might have to sell ourselves to the devil who will surely want his. And in return, the aging process starts and accelerates. Stacey Dash didn't look a day over 25 when she was running in slow motion through the Chicago airport, trailed by Kanye West in the music video, but one year working for Fox News, and the people say she's looking every minute of her age, and the decade she kept at arm's length all that time has finally come, and Lord, did it come to collect. All I know is I'm going to be on the wrong side of 30 soon, and I'm trying to keep my skin and my spirit clean, and so I spend way too much money on way too many products that I've never seen and don't understand. I apply my own own facial mask. I will say I have a much better skincare routine now. I wrote this like seven years ago. I apply my own facial mask, slathering on the white cream unevenly, too aggressively on my cheeks and forehead, but lightly around my eyes, my hands guided by even more anxiety than usual. And from underneath my coated eyelids, I scroll through social media 
Black people on the internet are upset about a party at some school. The theme was the hood or some iteration of what white people think the hood is. None of the participants were black, but most took measures to make themselves black. Darkness was achieved by what seemed like all measures, shoe polish, makeup, even markers, faces sloppily colored in. The party goers wore large fake gold chains and massive white tees swung to their kneecaps. They twisted up their fingers in homage to the gangs of their wildest imagination, sunglasses, and sneers adorn their white faces hiding poorly behind the splotches of brown and what a predicament me looking upon this with my face caked in some white substance which promises to keep my skin young and boys younger than i was in that moment throwing whatever they could on their young skin to make it darker and despite its history and its harm and the many echoes of violence it summons the thing about blackface that most clearly stung arrived in this moment looking upon this scene of recklessly adorned white skin while taking delicate care to help my own dark skin flourish. This, I whispered, is what they think we look like. Eight, I've had the dream where I hold Al Jolson wearing a dark coat of blackface under the water of an old bathtub. I do not know how I arrive in the scene, but I arrive with my hands on his shoulders, pushing him down below the water, which seems endless from any angle. In the dream, he's wearing the brown suit he wears while playing piano in The Jazz Singer. That movie was in black and white, as is this dream, but I know the suit is brown, and I know the suit is brown because I have, in my waking hours, stared at the poster from the film, which is painted in color. I know the suit is brown because on the poster, Jolson's face is not brown. The suit is the only interruption of white on his whole body. In the dream, Jolson does not struggle when I hold his head under the water. His eyes stay open. I scrub at his face with my hands until the scrubbing becomes clawing, trying to remove the layer of caked on dark skin to address the man underneath. In the dream, I don't know what I would say to Al Jolson if I could peel the mask from his face, but I do keep peeling and Jolson does not fight even as I swipe fingers across his eyes, eyes that, surrounded by the darkness of his makeup, gleam from underneath the water. When I push him down far enough, his face vanishes entirely, or at least I think it does. In a dream, nothing is tangible, even in a dream that arrives and arrives again. Only the smallest details remain. I know the tub is old. It's one of those with the massive claw feet. In the background, a version of blue skies is probably playing, but in this dream, I have convinced myself that it isn't Jolson's version because it is being sung by a woman, which means I tell myself it is Ella Fitzgerald, who I imagine would also want me to scrub the black makeup off this white man's face. In the dream, I think I hold Al Jolson down because if I can't detach him from the skin that looks like my skin, I at least want his eyes to stop glowing from beneath it. But the further I push his face down into the deepest parts of the water, I am left only to search the water for my own reflection, which looks dark, darker than I've ever been, so dark that it creeps along the water's surface like a shadow's dancing limbs. And then, as I lean closer to the water, I feel Al Jolson's suit snap itself empty, and I am not holding a body anymore. And then I wake up, and in the darkness of my real-life bedroom, I can't even see my own hands. Nine. Most of the black people knew that woman was white from the moment we heard her stumbling her way through that interview. Can't say much about what the eyes know. There are many ways to look black and bleep and be black, so I just can't call it. But some of my skin folks sure did. Some of them, the ones from places that get no sun, insisted that they could tell a bad tan when they saw one. The black women I knew said they knew the whole time because if she was black, no one would let her go out the house with her hair looking a mess like it did. But hey, she was a president of the NAACP, and that CP still stands for colored people, last I checked, but also it was the NAACP in Spokane, Washington. I was in Spokane once. The Black people were so invisible that everyone else would attempt to walk straight through us, so it's tough to tell, really, but even given every benefit of the doubt in regards to aesthetics, I knew the woman claiming to be Black was not Black when the interviewer asked her, are you actually African-American? And she replied, I don't. I don't understand the question. Thirteen. 
on the way to her family reunion in Birmingham that I am invited to just by virtue of being in town with some free time, my pal tells me she notices the way she and her people dance differently when white folks aren't around or when they truly don't care if and how white people are watching. She jokes about our other pal who dated a white man and had to teach him how to electric slide at one wedding some summer ago. And so we laugh at the image, her standing over him like she's coaching the final play of a high stakes game, laying out the moves herself while he looked down at his feet and tried to connect the dots. There's a difference between not being able to dance and the ability to fake being able to dance just well enough so that people won't notice. I participate most heavily in the latter, which is why the traditional line dances are perfect for me. The kinds where the entire framework of the song relies on laying out instructions for what one should do with their feet. I'm fine on any dance floor, but I love best when a room folds together in unison. It is almost impossible for anyone with any semblance of rhythm to make a mistake if they just move in the direction the room is already carrying them in. And I suppose that is something like love or something like trust. At the family reunion, there's one of those moments, aunties, uncles, grandbabies, and so on and so on, filling up a hot backyard after the food and revelry had died down, playing a version of the Cupid Shuffle so extended I was sure it had to be looped. And again, after a few rotations, there is everyone clicked together on beat until it appears there is one single body moving as one unit. I watched from afar and did not join in, even within the comforts of shared Blackness. There are deeper, unshared comforts, one that demands witnessing and not participation. Tell that to the world. There is some movement too golden, too precious to be interrupted. Fourteen. This is the last one I'll read. Fourteen. It is said that Al Jolson truly loved Black people, that he wanted in many ways to form a closeness with Black people in every corner of him they influence from music to language to dance. It is true that he gave Black people places to perform, even if they had to join him on stage while his face was colored darker than any of their faces. At his funeral, Black performers lined up to pay respects, tap dancers and background singers and jazz composers. It can be said that the very presence of a white person in the world of jazz fostered a type of closeness with Black people in their lives in that era when dependency and artistic exchange was a more high stakes game than it is today. But the thing I find myself explaining most vigorously to people these days is that consumption and love are not equal parts of the same machine. To consume is not to love and ideally love is not rooted solely in consumption. And I've never seen Al Jolson cry while singing the song Mammy, but the Black jazz composer Noble Sissel says there was no sight like it. What Jolson had was the palpable and physical presence of passion before being cool was what sold. Noble Sissel says Al Jolson cried while singing Mammy and it was one of the most beautiful things he'd ever seen. A single tear rolling slowly down Jolson's face while he crooned the old lyrics about black servitude. A woman who leaves her own family to care for another. The tear streaking through Jolson's black makeup and creating a clear border who Al Jolson was and who he was dreaming himself to be. And while we are here with our hands in the aesthetics of it all, I wish you would talk more about how frightening it all is. By you, I suppose I mean anyone, but let's say I mean you, non-Black reader or scholar of history. I wish we could get down to the bare bones of it all and talk about how Blackface, beyond anything else, is such a horrifying look. When done with careful precision, the way it was done in the old days in the Black and Whites, Black and White films interest me most when I think about how darkness is a currency and it is said that black is not a color, but the absence of color. Yet, in a film with no color, that absence is how one knows there is a potential for a shade. When white performers covered their faces with black paint in black and white films, and when they donned thick, nappy black wigs, wigs from behind a screen, all a viewer can witness is the whites of their eyes and the brightness of their lips peeling back occasionally and giving way to a blade of white teeth. It is a kind of vision that stuck with me as a child watching from a hallway floor and peering into the room of my grandmother who fell asleep with some classic movie channel network playing. These black people were like or unlike any I knew, all standing in a chorus of shadows, but for the small bursts of white leaping out from their mouths or their open eyes, I looked at myself in the mirror with the lights off the next morning just to see if I'd vanish. I smiled and opened my eyes as wide as I could, and yet I was still there. Thank you.
societies wander together like hopeful drops of a virus. Citizen testaments bent on offering me a nation of breadwinners to hold me back like it's a Brinks. I wrinkle the concrete sometimes like flesh. My Martin Luther King permanence turned away from a podium into the reeds like God is the dangerous twin. Black August to the mountaintop balcony on my bedroom floor. You know, uh, they steal you from the earth itself and suspend you and your broken neck from their fullest euphoria. From the loyalty oath of their gray superstitions, loyalty oath of their agrarian reform, I return to my mother completely disrespected. For peeling the heat off of purgatory, they kill poets like me. Walk me away from my poems, never to be heard from again. <laughs> In this final industrial complex, or, or bloodlines picked over, picked through, a sport and spiritual death of your devil at least half made police become a pretty word. I'm reading a lynch mob shoestrings like they were tea leaves teaching you how to write about cities. It's the 25th century in the mirror, people. Tyranny against your chump, trying your chump to be mocked even with a gun in your car. Uh, a cubit of needlework spelled tune for the proletariat, the relapse ministry. Talented people curled up in a fetal position next to a diamond, dying just another service day in the theatrics of tea house fascism in a bouquet of surveillance cameras, in the poverty of God. Newly, new blue eyes, corpses of water, newly potted presidency or one big shiny coin if you ask an animated capitalism and other non-literal voice killing his white freedom. The deification of hyphens, medicine bread and picture shows, great protesters in LA, guests of our ink, drop kicking roses in the graveyard, DC mink like a stone torn in half the pen advances, despite CIA guideposts, despite non-African past and futures, a metaphorical but not surreal day in a horn ridden life, horn player improvising king, like a radio prize fight featuring Shango himself, a real hand sweeps the land of racism. May I make progress with the gun? May I return to the ground? Our mother Emmanuel, you know, they put on music that evening a swinging type body language for you to drink with fermented $5 bills for your body language. Some applause, my past stomach line and neither a good thing nor a bad thing like being psychic on the way to a lethal injection. It'll sit you down with Lady Day. Lady Day leading youth who surrendered their souls to Africa too soon. Polity thought floating in a cup of water. She saved me accessing my stomach, accessing the love of the American lynched. Coast leaves wood and avalanche into the wrist. Our mother Emmanuel avalanching to the to the to the sharp keys, pain, the deal you make with pain. The piano makes sense for them. Laying hands on the world gradually, addressing the bend and necks on the streets of the north, travelers sailing in pain, addressing pain in the north. I mean, ten trigger fingers on that piano of harmony would have me putting a hundred fights on every direction off under Lady Day, leaning on trees again, recruiting the countryside itself, lay your plan out on this lightning. Make your poems the corner pocket of men. I've greeted the blues itself. America may clean my dead body, but will never include me. There goes the poet. Killing without killing. Never mind this painting of your language. May I be a meaningful lynching. A crow's passing, good and dead by the afternoon. I talk facing away from the dead. They replace me with the change in my pocket. A penny that's yet to be invented. They say, you have to know how to cut a throat on the way to cutting a throat. After sleeping on a mattress made from two garbage bags of clothes, I became content with the small gestures of plantation fries. I mean, playing with couch ashes, I realized how weird the universe was. It exists in so many places, so many random things that interrupts me while I'm trying to dream. Like your clay correspondence, Lord. To be transparent, I have 20 books next to a bullet like an old man giving advice at the beginning of a revolution. I've really done it, Lord. Explored the mumbles of my mind, explored what's naturally there, and I found no brainwashing. I found Africa, Lord. I have a future. It takes place in the diasporic South. I have morning possessions, modern militancy. I mean, windows to the South. I'll walk on a missile for food. I guess you will not want flowers for a few years, Lord. Will I be tied face to face with the country I murder? Merge with us, Lord. Our old metal versus new metal, our old metal versus pool of meandering and peerless faces, a multiculturalism of sorts. The dead replaced me with a comedian's chest cavity instead of a chest cavity held tight. It takes a violent middle man for me to talk to myself. Stories that travel through other people's stories, a song about a song, a hemisphere about a hemisphere. Stories that travel through a conquered poet. Hey, my mother remembers Africa, Lord. She killed on behalf of you, Lord. I wore a machete all winter and no one asked me what it meant. I read 1,000 books in front of the world. You know, what I do is fight poems. 
and sleep through decking in San Francisco prayer circles, watch people play for post-working class associative surfaces or recreations of a governor's desk, ruling class art of utility, playing fine and sociopathic bureaucrat. A day some white people scare even easier. TV in a basket next to a ceramic baby wearing ceramic armor, musket progeny fantasizing through the art of the poor that trendy latches locked before God. Black art hunted down like a dog and ha hand over my friends, Lord. Lord, I think I'm gonna die in a war. Unelected white people in my small house like blue song of no spiritual effect, a dollhouse age bomb, a pony show near dead bodies, apartheid weddings that go right, apartheid white people who give birth to mathematicians, the spiritual continuity of barracks and police stations, a chemical interpretation of a Sunday trip to church, church smells in their pockets, a river mistaken for a talking river, no autobiography outside of small personal victories of violence and drug use made in the image of God's trinkets, what white abolitionists confided in their children about. Chemical assurances that they will switch from black artists to white artists, from black God to white God, from black worker to white worker. You know, I think about you cautiously, Lord. In the same way I think about my childhood, Lord. Foxhole Friday nights, most of life is muted. Comedian points out a planet's field to a priest. King Sugar Cane, King Cotton, King Revolutionary to Bali Central, containing all modes of shallow introduction introducing. An unlisted planner class speaking about fevers and balance sheets and reassuring the masses that we can figure out our fathers later. A priest took my mother lightly, Lord. Stood in front of parishioners, re-raveling fantasies about black art, priest reading confidently before I broke him and broke his parallel. You know, after the day, I've never been a poet before. Little brother watches his big brother's friends. They leave rifles on shelter walls. They agree with me and call it literature. It's a simple matter, this revolution thing. To really lie to no one, to keep nothing God like, to write a poem for God. <laughs> yeah, right on. We in. Um, <laughs> Yo, thank you for that. I know it is. it's well. It's the thing where I love your work so much, and I never get to hear it. You know, I never get to. I get to read. I get to spend time with it, but to hear it is another thing. And so, uh, you know, that's why before I was like, "Yo, you got to read something," because I never get to like hear it in your own voice. Uh, man, I'm 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 beyond honored, man. Um, and, and uh, man, I, I you know, so we. we <laughs> We're going to begin this conversation, <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, you know, I I, I just uh, you know the the before you even say anything, I, I just want to tell tell everybody that th this is a book, um, this is a a book that you actually read to your loved ones, uh, as I have found myself doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, it's 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 a, it's a genius of um, a whole um, well actually uh, literally multiple dimensions um, as you know it's 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 a uh, it's just this this three four five thread weave of of um, of history of poetry of, of social criticism of of, of memoir you know. Um, that's that's really uh, uh, unparalleled. This is a um, this is a life this is a life changing book. Um, but uh, <laughs> let me ask you some questions now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so then you know I, I mean there's so many places to start. I, I am interested in how Columbus is looking right now. Yeah. Um. On, on, on the ground. Yeah. What what's going on? I mean, on the ground is pretty tough. Um, you know, folks have been following me at all. I was out all weekend and, um, you know, I, I think that, uh, for us, you know, in December there were, you know, Andre Hill and Casey Goodson were, were murdered like nine days apart, or 10 days apart. Mm -hmm. And it's hard. I think for a lot of folks here on the ground, it's, it's, there's a real understanding of the amount of grieving that one people can hold while trying to move forward, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's nothing new. I mean, you know, Columbus, as people are, you know, I see it's funny also, not funny, but of course it's uh, interesting to be in a place and see the national media attention just catch on, you know, like the media, uh, all the reports have been about how many people, how many young folks Columbus police have murdered uh, in the past few years and how like per capita Columbus is really high. But I mean, we've known that here because we've been in it, you know, like we've been steeped in it for, you know, the. Micaiah Bryan is not unique, unfortunately. Casey Goodson and Andre Hill are not unique. Um, this goes back to folks like Julius Tate, you know, folks who were murdered in the years before this one, Henry Green. And um, for me, I think, 
as someone who's organized for a lot of years, there's like enough grief to last a lifetime, you know? Mm. Um, and so to come to terms with this is such a difficult thing. And um, also to struggle with, you know, and I've gotten better at this because I kind of shut out the outside world, but to just struggle with like the public reactions to these things um, is hard because I'm here. You know, a lot of people are here. We're here, we're here on the ground. We're here placing flowers on the site of the murder. We're here checking in on families. You know, we're doing the work and um, there's time to be heartbroken, but um, not as much time to be cynical. Mm. And uh, I'm trying to balance that. How, how have, uh, ha have strategies, organizing strategies been evolving? Yeah. Um, what's, what's, what's been working, what hasn't been working? I think one thing that we've done here um, that I think is just going to be a slow moving thing, hopefully around the country, is just helping people in communities, uh, largely like marginalized communities, poor communities too, like not just not just black and brown communities, also like poor white communities to learn how to divest from calling the police and like learn how to divest from the actual institution of, of or the actual feeling of needing the police. Uh, which has been vital. I mean, I think um, I think we're also at a crossroads, though, because the police here after this summer were were so violent with protesters that they've almost stopped engaging with the actions that take place uh, in the actual streets. You know, so like shutting down a street is nothing now, which is you know, in some ways good, but I'm sure if we walked up in the city hall, it'd be a different thing. You know what I mean? If we like when we walked up to the mayor's house, it was a completely different vibe. Right. Mm -hmm. um, today, the mayor announced that he's going to um, like have a, a, a probe into Columbus police, but that doesn't really do anything. Mm -hmm. There was a probe into Columbus, uh, into CPD in like 1998. And that probe was like, yeah, shit's wild. You know what I mean? Police fucking up mm -hmm. And the city was kind of just like, cool. We got you. You know what I mean? Um, and so I'm not really confident in these moves. This is perhaps where my cynicism comes in when I don't want it to, uh, but I'm not really confident in these moves made by people in power because they know deep down inside that the presence of police upholds their power, mm -hmm. right? It upholds, the presence of the police upholds the mayor's ability to function with impunity. And so I'm not really confident that the mayor himself is all that interested in dismantling the core of the police, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so like, you know, one thing my homie Angel, the great poet Angel Nafis says is like, uh, I might be cynical, but I'm also not a fool. You know what I mean? And I try, that's like a big organizing principle for me. So my, my, st my organizing stance is what it's always been is that like these folks in power are not going to save these people who are in the streets and the most marginalized of the people who are in the streets. Like the mayor is not, not going to do that work. And so we got to do it on our own. Mm. Pan, panning out a little bit, what do you make of the uh, kind of broader or, or mass uh, political reality and how things are playing out? I, I always worry about uh, health and sustainability of movements, you know, which is that's always my big picture thing. And that's in part why I've gotten so focused locally, because I think in my younger organizing days, I was so focused nationally. Like well, I remember when when things were popping off in Ferguson, I was like, I get on a plane and go to Ferguson, mm. you know? And I don't regret those type of decisions, but I also think that, um, you know, I think sustainable movements are built when they're focused locally and led and organized by folks who are, who are like in, the, in these communities full time. And so I do worry about health and sustainability. Um, I'm really hardened by young organizers, particularly in the Midwest. Um, and I'm heartened by the way that I see organizing principles kind of flood into every other aspect of cultures that I'm a part of, be it publishing or music or, you know, some of them not in good ways, obviously, like, you know, we don't got to go into the way that like the idea of celebrity flaws, all mm -hmm. kinds of progress. Um, but I think in some ways it, it's a, uh, it's moving forward in, in a way that makes me feel hopeful. I don't know, how, are you a hopeful person? Or are you not? Uh, I'm a, a, a multi-headed hydra. <laughs> 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 when it comes to 
to to to hope and 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 despair and 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 various gradations. My 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 concern um is um is in the, I uh, well I got the same concerns as you. Uh, I I would just add also uh, just a, a kind of a, a, an, an anxiety about our ideological. Uh, kind of clarity what exactly we're subscribing to because right. a lot of this kind of you know what what also undermines um, efforts is this kind of reformist uh, tendency and uh, that 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 I, that I think is you know in, in a way um, walls a lot of people off actually from the mass reality or the or or, or the mass imagination um, you know, I, I, I'll uh, I'll spare I, I'll spare you the bitter anecdotes. <laughs> no, I'm with. I mean, you know what I mean. But I'm with. It, yeah, yeah. That that's you know. So, but but you know, actually, uh, the the, uh, the 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 most uh, en enthusiastic head of mine actually was 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 just uh, you, you know I I just saw a beautiful um, rally. There was the um, uh the i don't know if you heard of the frisco five out here oh yeah 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 i went on the hunger strike so so it was the yeah. five their five year anniversary um and it was you know it was in back back in front of the police station uh and, and uh you know the, the the police were out there in their uh full uh you know kind of nazi science fiction <laughs> you know postures <laughs> and um but but man the the n not only uh was um you know our spirit palpably stronger than theirs i did notice uh a, a kind of an improved politics uh oh, ma yeah. ma making its way through the making its way through the crowd and how people were actually organizing themselves and and uh and, and what people were saying um it gave 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 me some uh, gave gave me some hope. Um, how have you found uh, the the dance between uh, organizing and, and craft uh, for you? I think for me, honestly, like genuinely, for me, I, they've always felt entirely separate. In part because I was someone who organized before I wrote anything, like not, not anything like quote unquote worthwhile, like anything at all. You know what I mean? And so, and I've lived here my whole life, you know? And so normally, like rarely things will pop off where someone who's asking me to perform something at an action is saying like, will you read something? You know, like when Casey Goodson Jr.'s family had his, you know, birthday thing, they were kind of like, will you read something or will you speak? But normally it's on some shit where it's like, we need you on the ground to perform an action that has nothing to do with your ability or how the rest of the world sees you, which is what I prefer, you know, it's like, can you, can you stock a medic tent? You got a car, can you drive people? Can you extract people from the, from the action, right? Um, and I think because I'm able to kind of keep those things somewhat separate, I'm also able to stay grounded in like what I actually do. I understand that no book I write is actually gonna get anyone free, nor, nor do I write you know, there may be some ways that one could view my work as political education, but I think broadly, my investments are not, I'm not trying to fool anyone, you know, like I'm a pop culture critic, that's where my excitements lie, that's where my investments in the work lie. And so I don't really think like when I go to political education, there are other books I go to, like, I don't really dive into my old notes. And I'm like, okay, this is the roadmap to the revolution. But I also think that's fine. Mm -hmm. Because this is what I do and a part of who I am, but I'm also like seven other things, but not, not seven other things. Um, and a writer, I'm seven other things before I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. And I kind of got to be those things before I can effectively write, you know, and I need to be clear on what the work is doing, where it's coming from and how to best fulfill the parts of me that need to serve that work, but also fill the parts of me that need to, to not just organize, but be a good friend, a good sibling, a good dog owner, a good, sports fan like these kind of things too that um do not make me feel like i need to earn a moment of frivolous humanity in a violent time mm. right on 
Um, how how did you choose the uh, how, how did you choose the, the 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 frame or frames for this uh, book, or did the did the frame choose you? How 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 do you, how do you work? I think the frame kind of fell into place. You know, I was um, I was watching. I this, the great story of this book is that I got when I was kind of working on making the first draft into the second draft and making it a little bit more centered on celebration instead of trauma or pain. Um, a homie had sent me this hard drive of every Soul Train episode from 1971 and 1989. Really? And I'm someone like, I grew up watching Soul Train reruns, but the thing about watching reruns is, you know, like I grew up in the nineties. And so like, it's one thing to watch an episode of Soul Train from the seventies while in the nineties, because once a commercial hits, you're kind of back in that nineties world. You're in like a, you know, you get the Michael Jordan commercial or the whatever commercial. To get this hard drive where all the commercials were intact, all the Johnson brand stuff, all of that, it was like, I'm really in the world. I'm in the world Don Cornelius built, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, and that was the frame, like that was the central frame. It was like, how do I write every essay with the exuberance that I'm getting watching these Soul Train videos? And that was when I kind of reformatted the book, my whole thing was, I just wanna write one good essay about Soul Train. And then whatever else will fall into place. Everything else will fall into place. It, mm -hmm. And that kind of trust is a trust I hadn't had in any of my other projects before. All my other projects I've had to like in my brain map out what I believe them to be, which is a, it's a fool's errand, right? Like we're never, as, we're never as great at almost anything as we believe ourselves to be, even the work that we take to and that we map out. Mm -hmm. And so it was a different thing to be like, I'm just gonna pursue this one essay with the most exuberance I can and then the next one will open itself up to me. You know, it was kind of like uh, every essay felt like I was, I was in a maze testing a door and the doors happened to work. Mm. In, indeed they did, brother. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how, what, what are some of your, what are some of your uh, 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 research strategies? You have some like really, you, 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 you you had some deep digs, man. You you found yeah. Uh, you, found some, you found some gold, man. Uh, uh, what what what's, what what was your approach to research? So much stuff. Um, you know, I, I don't count. I mean, I'm a, I'm definitely a skeptic when it comes to a great many things. Um, but I think I'm a pretty that skepticism pays off, right? In the in the mode of research, because the thing that I'm always thinking is there's something else other than what's offered on like a surface level look on fucking Wikipedia or whatever, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm always in search of the something else. A perfect example of this is Ellen Armstrong, who I found out about Ellen Armstrong just by chance. You know, there was a moment where the phrase black girl magic was being commodified as these things do. Um, and it just sent my brain kind of down a rabbit hole where I was like, I bet though, I bet there's a black woman who was like the first black woman to do magic ever. Mm -hmm. And I found out about Ellen Armstrong and there's just not a lot about her online. And so it got to the point where I was calling, I was like cold calling magic historians, which I didn't even know that was a real thing, but um, I was just calling them and shout out to them. Cause they were great. I would call one in Syracuse and they would be like, Oh, I don't really know anything, but my homie out in Dallas knows something. I called Dallas and be like, oh, I don't know if I know anything, but you know, out in Sacramento, I got a friend. And that's kind of how I went down this road where it was like so much of, um, so much of immense like black cultural production is consumed by America and seeped into the American imagination. And what happens is the black performers who offered that production get left behind. Like their fullness gets left behind. So like folks like Black Herman, or the Ben Vereen thing at the Reagan inauguration where they didn't show the whole, the whole shit, right? These type of things where, um, and so the questions I always brought to the table were, well, it's one thing to write about the production. America knows the production because it's, it's uh, well-versed in the theft of that production. But like, what about the person behind the production who America has, has somewhat left behind or placed in an easily digestible box? which is why I talked about Josephine Baker doing work with the French resistance in her later career too, in her later life and why I dug for Ellen Armstrong and why um, 
I return to folks like Black Herman and Burt Williams. Who... Hold on, don't give up too much. Don't give them. Okay. Don't yeah, give yeah. Much. <laughs> let, 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 let them find. Let, let, let them find out, man. All the, <laughs> man, all the, all of the, um, man, all of the rooms you, you, you know, just, just all of the rooms of history you open. Um, is, is, how, how do you find now? You know. Not, not, you know, not, not a kind of a. Um, I'm not hoping for a certain kind of answer, but uh, just curious, um, you know, how do you experience history? How does your mind um, engage it? Again, given this kind of just this, this, this almost psychic double jointedness you displayed through the book, and also just, you know, the kind of just the ability to bring everyone. Uh, kind of in the, on, onto the same uh, dance floor, no pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> is it? Do you find you know? This is as is a question I asked. I, I got to ask Gerald Horn before. I'm really curious about uh, 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 how 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 history um, kind of yeah. is to you. I mean, I grew up. I grew up in a house where, on one, I was raised Muslim, so we didn't really like rock with any traditional quote unquote American holidays. But also I grew up in a house with with a father who was like a self-taught radical in some ways. Uh, I don't know if he would define himself as that, but I, I think that my experience with him and his, his commitment to self-education felt radical to me. And so like on Thanksgivings, um, he would like have an encyclopedia on the table and have like places highlighted where me and my siblings would have to read about the, the you know, the genocides and, and the, you know, these type things. Um, on these holidays, the work would be reading and researching. And so my relationship with history has always been fascination and curiosity and, and a real excitement to feel like I'm getting to the bottom of something that was kept from me. Mm. Um, even if I... And even, and I mean this even in the most, I take that approach to even the most mundane bit of researching, right? Um, you know, even researching things like Soul Train, which was inherently joyful, I still kind of took that approach because I think that approach makes me somewhat relentless in my pursuits of things. If I just keep saying, I'm returning to my skeptic nature, but if I, keep, if I just keep saying, this can't be it, mm-hmm. there's got to be more, I'm not satisfied. Because so much of my time, because of how I was raised in the house I was raised in, so much of my time spent in, act, in school was spent doing that, was spent saying, this can't be it. Like what I'm learning in this framework cannot be it. Mm. And I don't have the tools, you know, to find out, but I'm going to find something better out. Mm. When I think about the idea of abolition broadly to me is fighting for and imagining a world that I reasonably reasonably may not be alive for right mm. and still removing the ego enough to still fight for that world understanding that i might not be able to reap whatever benefits of it might exist and i don't i don't mean that in a morbid sense or even an abstract sense yes in the very ross gay sense i could die tonight but also i could live you know inshallah i'll live seven decades and still not see the fruits of that work but that work will be the work um and I think that kind of imagination in that kind of endless, that imagination that fuels an endless pursuit is the same imagination I take to the research in the, the idea of history. It's like, I'm not, I wasn't there. I didn't live through everything. So I can't get to the full bottom of this, but I have to keep working because there's a bottom that I haven't seen yet. Mm. It, it was interesting too about the about the book. What 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 you what, what you make me think about um, now um, is is interestingly you have this uh, you know just super kinetic um, you know excavation um, of of a fact um, at the same time. Uh, just really sitting still yourself with a lot of vulnerability, the parts of the book that are, that are about you. It's like an, an, an almost an, an interesting dual posture of, you know, and on, on the one hand, you're like lightning moving. <laughs> and on the other hand, you're just sitting, you're allowing yourself to be struck 
Um, how 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 does how does that how does that play? How did that play out? How did they did they you know did, yeah. how, how did they complement each other? Did it was or was there a, a conflict? No, I, I don't think there's a conflict because in some ways I don't really think about it. Mostly because I grew up or I, I came of age listening to a lot of things, but one of those things was the blues, right? Delta blues specifically, you know, uh, Delta blues in the nineties, you know, like T-Model Ford and Junior Kimbrough and thing about folks like that is, I think one thing I love about the Delta blues is that um, there's the great trick of, you think something's moving at light speed, but it's actually moving really slowly. Like Junior Kimbrough's songs, very danceable. You dance in them joints all night, but at, with the mechanics of the lyric and the mechanics of the narratives happening within the songs are actually really slow and turning over a larger emotional curiosity, which Delta Blues isn't the only place this happens. I mean, I think it just happens in a lot of musical forms. Um, Fleetwood Max Rumors has a lot of songs like that, but that's where my interest in investment is. It, it's in tricking people into thinking that a lot of different things are happening, like in the Blackface piece or in the Black People in Space piece where there's a lot of moving parts and vignettes, tricking people into movement, but they're actually not moving very far at all. We're actually going really slow and really orbiting around one central thing. The best example of that is that performance of softness piece at the end of the book that moves around timelines really fast. Mm -hmm. um, but really that that piece is just about a slow moving ache of not rising to the occasion of loving the men in my life or being too immature to reckon with masculinity in a way that allowed me to love the men in my life when I was younger. That's all that piece is about. Mm -hmm. It's And it's just tricking people. I mean, you know, that I think if there's a way that I am most a poet, it's that I'm mischievous and I enjoy uh, perhaps a bit from the Terrence Hayes school where I enjoy fooling people and I don't really mind if they know that it's being, that it's happening or not. I derive satisfaction from the idea of mischief. Mm. But part of that is because that idea of mischief is protective for me. And so like the mischief isn't because it, I'm not like sitting at home, like, haha, I got you. I'm smarter than you. I'm sitting at home being like, well, if they fall for that, they maybe won't see that I am being more vulnerable than I'd like to be. Or then I, it prevents me from being like, damn, I can't believe this book is in the world and people are going to read me being this vulnerable. You know, I can't live with that. I'm too, uh, I'm too sensitive, probably. <laughs> right on. How, how, what, 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 um, you know, how, how, what is, what, what evolved you, you know, towards this, um, t towards this ability, um, to you know, to 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 provide us with you know, to uh, to provide us with this human sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's because I always wanted to be like a big dramatic. I wanted to be a musician. I mean, I know you play. You play guitar, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and there's something that I wanted in that that I could never achieve. You know, like I tried playing trumpet when I was a kid, and I was bad at it. Realistically, I was bad at it because I didn't practice. Um. And so, you know, it's one of those things where like, I saw Miles Davis on the cover of an album and I was like, I want to do that. And then I got, I got the trumpet and it was like, I can't do that. Then I, you know, tried piano and I wasn't good, but I wanted the dramatics of songwriting because before anything, before poetry, before prose or any of this shit, I was just a fan of music. Like I grew up in a musical household. I grew up in a very musical era. Like I grew up, you know, I feel like I feel like we are, it's interesting because I feel like we are of the same generation or a similar generation. We grew up in very musical eras with very different musical eras because of our geographies. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Which of course propels me to, to say rest in peace, Shock G. Um, but um, because of that, and because I grew up in a visual music era, like I grew up watching rap videos or watching music videos, I wanted that. I always like, I want to be a musician. I want to have big dramatic music videos. I want to be able to express my emotions visually so that I don't have to express them textually or simplistically or plainly. And as it turns out, uh, I am not actually good at what I want. Uh, I'm, I'm exceptionally perhaps good at what I don't, what I don't want, which is, the great dilemma of my life but i do think that um because i have gotten so good at very plainly expressing my emotions loudly um i had to figure out a way to dress that up i had to figure out a way to 
make people think that the feelings are the side dish when they're actually like all three courses. Mm. Man, I, I, I too was defeated by the trumpet. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It doesn't seem like it should be that hard. Man. Like three this, vows? Right, 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 right. But it's, it's a, um, man, it, it, it requires a whole different almost uh, physical meditation. I, I it's wanna, like a marathon. I've been telling people yeah. like like wind instruments. It's like you got to be in a different type of shape, almost. Mm, for real. Uh, and, and and nothing necessarily prepare prepares you like normal life doesn't. You know what I mean? Like I I, I already kind of twiddle my fingers around. So laying it on a on a guitar at least has some kind of physiological precedent you know I mean? <laughs> yeah. but the trumpet we don't even yell the way that that uh you know the, the way air is supposed to, is supposed to move I, I i i apologize to our viewing audience who have questions <laughs> i will now defer to your questions now and i did see you earlier amy uh question uh, can you talk about uh, the choice of writing style it's really interesting and liberating to read this prose. Oh, thank you. Uh, the reality is I don't really know what I'm doing, if I'm being <laughs> real. <laughs> I didn't, you know, like I don't have any quote unquote traditional, right, you know, I, I didn't go to, I don't have an MFA, I didn't study, you know, I studied like marketing for a little bit in college. That's it, you know? Um, and so I think guided by folks like Zora Neale Hurston, all I know is, is how to, to write as though I would speak, which is why I think reading out loud also comes easy to me. Mm -hmm. um, because so much of my practice revolves around, for folks who know me, and I don't know if there's anyone in the room who knows me a bit, but for folks who know me, it's very much the way I speak. It's very meandering, um, not linear, short bursts that try to encompass as much as possible. And it's, I think, because I'm the youngest of four, right? I'm the youngest of four, and that meant that almost by default, the amount of time that people were willing to give me attention was smaller, right? To grow up in a house where you're the youngest and there are older folks who are doing undoubtedly more important things than you are, I learned to speak and I learned to put a lot of things in a small space at a very young age mm. because I knew that the amount of time I had to hold someone's attention was a fraction of what everyone else had. Mm. And so I think when I think about my work now, I see that whenever people are like, tell me how you're the youngest and where it shows up. I'm always like in the work, it's in the work, entirely in the work. Uh, and I think maybe that affects my writing style more than any kind of ivory tower ever could. Mm. Um, th th this next question wants to get back to vulnerability. I mean, you, 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 you spoke some um, on it already but is, is there something you would add that you yeah would i mean talk? just that i you know i think the work of vulnerability makes me a more capable or the work of kind of mining my own vulnerability and my own capacity for vulnerability makes me a more capable person uh in the face of um just really horrendous circumstances. Like I think I need, I am almost required to unlock something other than rage or, mm. or grief, mm. you know? And vulnerability is the, the only bridge that I've ever known. Um, and it also feels generous to me. It feels generous to me to, to not only offer my own vulnerability, but to say that I am eager and always willing to ask others to do the same and be very specific in that I'm not going to ask anyone to do that, do the work that I'm not willing to do in, in the emotional, in, in when we're talking about like the emotional crafting of a relationship or the emotional work that goes into building an actual relationship in an actual community. Um, I'm not going to task anyone with doing work that I'm not about myself. Mm. Uh, this next question, my teenage, my teenagers and my students seem to listen to a constant flow of other voices and inputs. How best do we teach them to discern and stand in and speak their own truth? Um, 
I think, I mean, I, I probably have a, not a great answer to this, but I also think that just like, I work with a lot of Columbus State school students and high school students, um, I, just decentering. What I see often is that it's so freeing to decenter the idea of hierarchy. Mm. Uh, in, I mean, in a lot of places, obviously, um, in a lot of modes. But when I walk into a classroom or, or every year, and I guess this year I'll go back if they have it, I teach at Kenyan Young Writers. It's like two weeks with, with writers from all over the world, like 15 to 18 years old. And the thing that I always say the first day I walk into the room is that we're all writers. Like, I don't really give a shit about this instructor student hierarchy. Like y'all have to push me as much as I am. Y'all actually don't have to, like we're required if we're gonna be in community with each other as writers, you are required to push me just as much as I pushed you for two weeks. And that's it, like, that's all I'm trying to hear. I'm not trying to hear anything else. Um, and I think that removal of hierarchy really empowers folks to make decisions around their own writing and their own voice and the immense capability that particularly our young folks have in the ability that our young folks have to articulate the world from their perspective. Some of the best movements in Columbus at least have been led by high school students because of what they're capable of seeing that we're not. And um, I don't wanna stifle that ever. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you approach such a big project like a book of essays? It feels so overwhelming, where do you start? Um, I start by writing a lot of things that I tell myself from the beginning that no one's ever gonna see. It's always like a little small project, you know, for this, for this book, for example, I wrote a bunch of little vignettes that were about, um, uh, gosh, it was so long ago. What did I pick? Oh, it was about the, the, uh, 1985 dunk contest. Mm. You know, I was like, no one's going to see these, but I need to get in a mode where I'm writing about something that I like. Mm. So I know what it is to feel good about something I'm writing without the hindrance of being like, I got to turn this in or this has to be edited or whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, that gets me in the mood to feel like I can tackle a larger project. If I can write like eight to 10,000 words that no one's gonna see and walk myself through a big idea and come to a conclusion, that's also like a detaching of the ego, right? Um, and a reminder that everything I write does not have to be a capital P product. Mm -hmm. And once I get into that headspace, I think I can take on anything. Mm -hmm. That's a bit confident. I mean, I really can't take on anything. But that's the whole thing about writing a book is that, or and some of this is because I grew up playing sports. I played sports in high school and in college. And um, so much of the function of playing sports in my life was just like convincing myself that I was greater at something than I actually was. You know what I mean? This is the whole game is just like lying to myself about what I'm actually capable of uh, until I get to the end. And then I... I don't, you know, then it's like, well, I'm probably not capable of something like this on a regular basis, but I did it for now. You know, I did it for these 300 pages or whatever, mm. and I'm satisfied with that. Mm. Uh, what propels you in your writing? How do you keep going and uh, reiterating? Um, I'm someone who just really believes in propulsion by way of ancestors reminding myself that I'm not the only one who's done this work um, and that I will never be the only one who's done this work and that I come from a lineage of writers. I never want, you know, I'm so over, I, I'm, people who know me know I'm just a massive Toni Morrison disciple. Miss Morrison means the world to me and more than any other part of her legacy, the part of her legacy that I love the most is how eagerly and aggressively she rejected the idea of genius. Mm -hmm. You know, if someone tried to project genius on her, she would reject it pretty plainly because she knew that with black folks particularly, the idea of genius leads to scarcity. And mm -hmm. scarcity is the enemy of accountability. It's gonna be enemy of growth. It's enemy of community building. Um, and so it's important to me always to be propelled through my work by the understanding that I am sitting in a lineage of writers, known and unknown, living and not, who I owe it to to not imagine that I am the only one doing this work. And because of that, I can take to the work more freely and more eagerly. 
knowing that there's a path that I'm already on and that I don't have to build my own path. Um, you know, that's, that's the most generous thing for me and the most exciting thing for me. And that propels me more than anything else because uh, it's a reminder that I'm not alone in the work. Mm. Uh, inquiring minds would also like to know, uh, will you write more pieces about being a sneakerhead? <laughs> Probably not. It's weird because I feel like my relationship with sneakers is interesting because, you know, I don't know, being a person who collects sneakers is like not cool in some ways uh, or like the ways that I think the ways that I think it's cool in the media are not the ways that I wanted that I wanted that to be projected. Like, I don't want that to be projected on me. Um, but I do think that I'm interested in writing a bit more about sneakers from a very real fascination standpoint, like a, a, a just a, and I'm not someone who dwells a lot on material either, but um you know, I'm fascinated. Like I have a pair of shoes from, from, I have a pair of sneakers from 1996 that have just organically begun to yellow. They, the, the like soles of them have begun to yellow. And there's like an aging process that just happens because they're fucking old. And there's something about that that's kind of beautiful to me, how a sneaker ages much like anything else or anyone else or anywhere else. Um, I, the only writing, in, the only interest I have in writing about sneakers is in that kind of like tactile very real tactile sense not like um i don't know I'm, i am currently like rebuilding like drilling holes into my wall and putting shelves in my wall to to hold my sneakers and get them out of the sunlight uh and it's it's fucking terrible um i'm not i i it's wild because i think i'm a handy person until i actually have to do some shit you know what i mean and then it's like oh i actually don't know what i'm doing at all but you know that's that's part of the journey i guess we're all growing Right on. And uh, last question, what is the most interesting thing you learned while writing The Little Devil in America? Oh, I mean, definitely Ellen Armstrong was the one. Ellen Armstrong was, it's just wild in my, because I feel like I go down rabbit holes all the time that don't produce anything. And I don't even mean produce like capital P for the public. But I mean, sometimes I just spend a lot of time Googling and YouTubing. And at the end, I'm like, well, that was, you know, that was empty, um, but it's kind of wild to just like have a thought about black girl magic and be like, and then type into Google first black woman magician and, and just find something, you know, and find like an abundance, not an abundance of information, but a door that would lead to an abundance of information. You know, something that I'd never even thought about before. Ellen Armstrong was something, who the first black woman magician was, I would never have considered before. And, um, Unlocking that was just stunning for me. Mm. And I sat in awe of that forever. Also, one thing I want to say is that Josephine Baker, you can watch, I'm in awe of this still. You can watch 50 years of her career on YouTube. Like her performances uh, go back. There's video footage of her performances from 19, the 1920s to the end of her career in the 1970s. And I just think that's, to me, that is so amazing. Like, it's so amazing that we have that living archive, mm. you know, of someone's life and career over the course of five decades, which I just don't think we get with, especially with Black women performers, like specifically Black women performers, right? Um, and so I'm immensely in awe of that and remain in awe of that. Right on. <laughs> well, Unless somebody puts four more quarters in the, uh, <laughs> 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 the time is up. Uh, uh, man, great, greatly appreciate you. It's such a, uh, man, such a generous, um, man, you got, you got just a super generous soul in, in, in mind, man, and, and appreciate all that you shared today and all that you, you sharing in, in, in this book, um, you know, and just much, much love and, and, and okay. respect and, and, and solidarity, of course, the folks out there in Columbus. No doubt. Tongo, thank you for your work. And thank you for our, the way that you teach and, and, and guide folks. That I think is uh, just invaluable. And I learn a lot from you. And I'm so much gratitude for you being here tonight. Right on, man. Respect. Thank you both. I feel like I have learned so much just getting to listen to both of you here. So thank you for your work, for your organizing, 
I encourage everyone to get yourselves a copy of this book. It's an incredible read. Um, thank you. Please continue supporting uh, your bookstores, your arts institutions. Um, we did put information in the chat. If you are able to quickly fill out a program survey, we do appreciate any feedback about this program. It helps us best serve our communities. Um, if you're able to financially support the museum, you can visit our website, which is moadsf.org. Um, again, support the library, support your libraries and all your communities. Um, and I want to thank you all for being here and sharing this space and hope you have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, Nia. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everybody.